Hello everyone. Today I would like to discuss uh, a subject that has been on my mind for a long time. In fact, uh, when I did my first project something around 40 years ago, the client who, talk, who came to get his structure design, he asked me this very simple, innocent question. He said, is my structure going to be safe after you design it? And I thought about it and I was wondering, can I answer this to him honestly? Because I didn't know the answer. All I knew was that I'm going to follow the design codes and I told him that I will follow the design codes and that's what I know. And the client was surprised and not satisfied. He said, but I want you to tell me explicitly, is my structure going to be safe? And I didn't really have the answer to that. And to this day, we are still struggling for the same question. Are our structures safe? So I will try to address this question today and see how the performance-based design may provide one of the solutions and why we need to do a performance-based design of structures to be able to answer questions like this. So let's look at this, this question and then the second part of this question is, is my structure safe against what? So in fact, that's what I asked him. I said, what do you mean safe against what? Against, he said, whatever comes to the structure in its life, is it safe? And then if you look at that, a structure could be subjected to a lot of hazards and they could be coming from the earth-based hazards like earthquakes, volcanoes, glaciers, tsunamis, or could be water-based floods, wind storms, air-based and fire-based. So there could be many types of hazards that may hit the structure during its life. And we actually still in a, not in a position to model all of these hazards precisely. So let's look at why a structure actually needs to be safe. Because this is part of a bigger question and why a structure that we design needs to, to, needs to be safe. And that actually comes back to the hazards and the necessity to make the structure safe for the society. So let's look at how the hazards and safety are connected. And this is related to disaster. We all read the news about disasters. We know a disaster you know, uh, makes life difficult for many people and in many countries, in many events, earthquakes, floods, and so on. So if you look at the disaster, it's a product of three things. The hazard, which is a natural or man-made uh, event. And then vulnerability is the inappropriate built environment or the weaknesses in the environment that is being hit by the event. And exposure is the people who are exposed to that or property or value that is exposed to that. So if a disaster is high, if we have high exposure, high vulnerability, and high level, level of, of hazard. So we cannot do much about the hazards at some time. Sometimes we can. Exposure, we can reduce the exposure, we can evacuate the buildings, or we can make them uh, make the buildings where there is a low hazard. So exposure, we can control. But most importantly, as structure engineers, we control the vulnerability. That means the weakness in the structure. And that's why safety becomes important. Because if the structure is safe, then the vulnerability will be low, and then the disaster will be low. So let's come back to how we can make the structures less vulnerable to these events. So we can reduce the risk. And after we reduce the risk, that means we can make the whole society or community more resilient and, and less averse to the risk. So if you go back in history, long time ago, uh, 1700 BC, uh, there was a king called Hammurabi, and he was the first person who tried to codify these things uh, for the safety of the people. And one of his, and he made a long code, and one of the clauses in the code is that if a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built falls in and kills its owner, then that builder should, shall be put to death. So it was very, very severe consequences of improper design, construction, or impro of safety. So the builder was completely responsible for the safety of the structure that they built to the extent that their own life was at stake. So this was very, very severe, but that's what they, they, they did at that time, completely gave the builder the full responsibility of the design, construction, and whatever, no excuses were left 
to be heard. So that was a long time ago. Fortunately for structural engineers, we are not in this society, and we have other ways to do that. But now in this modern day, we actually need to to deal with this question of who is responsible, because at that time, the, the, the responsibility was given to the builder. Currently, a project has owner, architect, structural engineers, geotech consultants, peer reviewers, builder contractors, building codes, structural design codes, lawmakers, building officials, and legal and justice system. We have very complex society now. So right now, if something happens to a structure, it is very difficult to assign where the responsibility is because this is a product of so many, so many collaborations and so many different uh, expertise coming into the, the construction of a, of a typical building. But still, the structural engineer is considered to be one of the key stakeholders in the responsibility for the safety of the structures. So, Considering that, uh, one of the famous structural engineers that you might have heard the name Hardy Cross, especially uh, the people who have been were working for a long time, this was a Hardy Cross method of moment distribution. Uh, so he, at that time, uh, in, uh, in the 50s or 45, 50s, he, he said that now we need to have an assembly line of engineers. That means we need to train the engineers in a certain way to do things and we need to have rules and guidelines for them so that we can rely on their output for public safety. Because in the past, the builders were very skilled or very few people who could do that. But now we, when we have large need of the construction, a large number of engineers become involved. And not all of them may be expert. So we need to make sure that we train them in a certain way and guide them and restrict them. And then he proposed at that time the idea of this, this that we, we have we codify these things. Of course, the building codes had started to come up even before that, but he really uh, you know, uh, expressed the idea that we need to have standardiz standardization. And this is an interesting sentence. He said, standardization as a check on fools and rascals or set up as an intellectual assembly line. So he wanted to make sure that people who are very uh, innovative or courageous, he called them fools and rascals. He said they should be stopped from uh, you know, implementing their ideas because it might impact the public safety. Or so, um, and so they should be controlled by these guidelines and rules. And that was where the building codes started. So building codes rely, building industry now relies on the building codes to take care of that safety issue from them. So they have specific requirements, they give acceptable solutions, they also prescribe detailed procedures, rules and limits, how to do something. Mostly they are based on experience and testing, but not always rational. And I will explain that as we go along. The spirit of the code is very good. The spirit of the code is that they want to make the structures safe for the public safety, as I mentioned. So they want to make sure that whoever designed the structure in the end, the public safety is not compromised. And that's the, that's the uh, spirit. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really great spirit, and it should be something that we uh, appreciate. And then it is assumed that if we comply to the code, literally, by, to the letter of the code, the spirit of the code will automatically be satisfied. And this is where the problem starts to come because the letter of the code and the spirit of the code are not necessarily compatible in many cases. And we are not sure whether if we follow the letter of the code, will the spirit of the code be satisfied or not. And that's where, to me, the, the first problem starts where we need to look beyond this building codes uh, in, in a literal manner. For example, take this example of a railing. The height is fixed or is specified in the building architectural codes and building codes to be, let's say, a minimum of 900 millimeter. And this idea is that people should not fall uh, when they're standing close to the parapet. And so the railing height needs to be at least that much. Look at this statement, which was made a long time ago. And it says, in case you build a new house, you must also make a parapet for your roof that you may not place blood guilt upon your house because someone falling might fall from it. So it was said long time ago that you must make a parapet so that people should not fall from it. Now, this is, this is done in 
somewhere in you know 2000s this is taken from there or it, 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 in even 1900s and this was specified in 1300 BC so you can see that the two are very different one is saying make the, the uh, parapet 900 millimeters one is saying make the parapet such a way that nobody falls from it so this is prescriptive this is performance based here if the contractor or the builder makes the parapet 900 millimeter and somebody still falls down the, the designer or the contractor is not responsible because here they follow the code so they cannot be held responsible if somebody falls from it here they say make it such that nobody falls from it now let me bring you to another interesting uh, observation. This is my own apartment building, two different levels. So I was living on the ninth floor earlier, and on the ninth floor, the height of the, uh, the railing was actually this much, 900 millimeter or so, according to the code. And we felt safe. We didn't feel any reason that it was not, not adequate. Then we moved to 37th floor. And then I found that on that 37th floor, same balcony had a height much higher than the code requirement. People had added, the building not, had, did not do that. The resident had added two more bars on the railing because they didn't feel safe even though the height was the same, the, the code building height was the same. And this is related to the consequence of the, the decision on a risk. Because from the ninth floor, people didn't think it was serious enough. So they didn't feel unsafe. But from 37th 30, floor, they felt that the consequence was too grave and it, we cannot take the chance. So they decided to increase the height to higher level. This is now going beyond the code. And this is making a decision based on the severity or the consequence of the decision, not only on the basic requirement of the building code. So we have now two examples here which are related, but they explain the point that I'm trying to make, that building codes not always safe or do not give the impact of being safe. Now let's see what is the mod modern, what is a modern building code intending to do? What is the spirit of the code? Basically, they define something so they can ensure safety. They are not concerned about monetary damage, by the way. They are concerned about public safety. So they define appropriate hazard levels for you, so you can consider you don't have to actually define the hazard level, so they define that for you, loadings. They define the limits on structural systems, members, and material that you can use. You cannot use this one, you cannot use this height, you cannot use this system. So they tell you what not to do and what to do in a certain situation. They define procedures for analysis. You can use the uh, static analysis for this, this height of building, then you need response spectrum for this height, you need dynamic analysis for that height, and so on, or this hazard, and so on. So they define the procedures also for you, what kind of analysis you can design you should do. Then they provide rules for detailing. Then um, beyond that, they also tell you how to place the, the reinforcement, how to do the connections. Beyond the design, even if you do the design, they still give you more rules, which are on top of the the, the basic design that you have calculated. Even though you calculate some spacing, they say, no, 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 minimum spacing should be that much. Or if you calculate number of bars, they say, no, no, that's not, you may, you may have computed, but you have to provide minimum. So the detailing rules come on top of that. And then provide specification for construction and monitoring, what should be done at construction site and so on. And then hope, finally, that all of this will reduce vulnerability of the structure and make it safer and make the community safer. That's the intent, that they do all of that with the hope and I repeat the word hope that this will make the structure safer and reduce vulnerability. Now the question is, does it all really work? Yes, it mostly does, most of the time. But how do we know that it works in all cases? How do we know that it works in a particular case like my client in his building case? Can I explicitly tell him that your particular structure is safe? and for what earthquake or what flood and so on. Let's come back to the structural requirements. For example, these are two requirements from two different codes. You can see how detailed they are. At the same time, they are a little bit arbitrary. Reality is continuous, but they will give you limits which are not continuous. They are, they are in groups. For example, length range. Here, L over D, 
2.2 and 2.5. What about 2.01? What about 2.45? Is should I take 2.5? So we just round off the numbers. That means it's not the continuity that in real structure is not represented in the rules and guidelines. They are discrete. So you don't know really what's happening in between, and you do not know what happens if I don't follow it for a beam which is 2.01 or, or 1.9. So, so engineers have to use judgment to interpret these these classes and then that makes structures different because different people may interpret it slightly differently they may round up round down or they may you know justify some things based on their own experience and same as here the rules about the confinement of the ties in a column should we follow them everywhere should, is every column going to be subjected to the same level of uh, uh, vulnerability is every column going to be um, you know, subjected to the same level of rotation and so on we don't know but we follow the rules everywhere because that's what the code tell us so this is prescription that means we just follow the detailed rules. Now after that, coming back to this question, can I still say that if I follow all those rules, is my structure safe? And what if I do not follow one rule? That, does that automatically make my structure unsafe? Or how do I say how unsafe it is now if I don't follow one or two or three rules? Or what about an existing building where somebody made the construction and they missed two stirrups in a beam, does that automatically make the whole structure unsafe because it didn't follow the code? How do you answer questions like this? So for the public, the question is simple. Will the building be safe? But as I mentioned, safety has so many uh, definitions. For the owner, the question is, will the building collapse? Will it be damaged after an event? Can I use the building after a given earthquake? How much will, it, will the repair cost if it is damaged? How long will it be open or closed for repairs? Can I make the building that will not be damaged and will not collapse? That's a big question. A client may say that I would like to make a building that will never collapse or never be damaged because it's a, it's a building of that kind. Can we do that? Because codes do not intend to do that. Codes limit the damage. They don't say it will not be damaged. They say damage will be such that it will be safe. So the, the expectation is that the structure will be damaged. What if we don't want it to be damaged? How do we do that? So the structure engineer, if they ask the structure engineer, the question is, I'm not sure about all of this, which is true. They're not sure. They can only say, I, but I do follow the code. The, quest, the answer is, I do follow the code. I will follow the code. Somebody might come to, to say, say, I would like to design a building which is for the life of 500 years, design life of 500 years. The building codes think about 50 years. How do you design a building for 500 years and how do you ensure that it actually will survive 500 years? So those are the questions that the public would like to ask, which for, to them are simple, but as structural engineers, they are extremely complex. To answer all of these questions, we have to look at the big picture of the structural engineering or structural design itself. Why do we do the design? Number one, the purpose of the design. Why are we doing this design? Is it for safety? Is it for containment? Is it for storage? What is the purpose? Then how to achieve the design purpose? How do we make sure that whatever we, we decided, we will be able to achieve it? How to confirm that the design purpose is achieved? It's one thing to say that I'm going to do this design and achieve this purpose, but then how do you confirm that it has actually been achieved? Then what to do if design purpose is not achieved? How do you make that decision? Let's say design purpose is not achieved. For example, like I said, somebody did not put enough ties somewhere. Do we demolish the structure and put those ties back? Or what do we do in that case? And what is the consequence if the design purpose cannot be achieved? Like I said, if we cannot go back and fix something, or it just cannot be done, what is the consequence to the public, to the owner, and so on? These are the questions that we do not have the answer for. That's why we need to go beyond the code. And I want to give you one more example before we, we do that. So this is the typical detailing for recommendation for a beam uh, in a seismic zone, for example, and then this, the spacing of the hoops is, is specified a certain one. So the question is, is it specified that the minimum spacing or the maximum spacing should not be more than 100 millimeters? What happens if it is 120 millimeters? 
Will I gain something if I make it 75 millimeter? These questions are not answered by the code, by the, the, by the rules that are here. My other question is, do I need to do it every beam, even if the beam is not participating in the seismic uh, activity, or it's not going to have the rotation, it's not going to yield, because I, I, I know this, it's not a beam in a location, do I still need to do that? So these are the questions that we cannot answer. And what happens to the performance, or what happens to the safety if I change something here, a little bit, or more? What happens if a structure was built earlier where the, the previous code had the limits of 150 millimeter, and now the building code has changed, and it says now it should be 100 millimeter. Do I go back and demolish all the buildings and build them again with 100 millimeter? Of course not. But the question is, are they safe? as no building safe because if I build a building now and it's not following the code, technically speaking, it's not safe. But what about the buildings that have already been constructed according to the previous code, which was safe until the new code came in and now suddenly they become unsafe? How do we address that? So all of these questions are, are real ones. And it happens all the time because the building codes change every three or four or five years. So does that mean that the structure design previously have suddenly become unsafe or non-conforming. So for that reason, we need to go to performance-based design. That's the why of the performance-based design. Because the codes lack the explicit performance indicators. They lack the procedures ex that explicitly give us the answers to this question that I mentioned just now. Performance-based design required the designer to assess how the building is likely to perform not follow the rules and hope it will perform, but actually determine how it is likely to perform for a certain event, be an earthquake, be a strong cyclone, or a fire, or whatever. And then identify areas of weakness and fix them so that it does perform properly. And it intends to answer the question of the safety. How do design decisions actually impact the safety. And that's where the performance-based design becomes valuable to us. That's why we need performance-based design which goes beyond the building codes. So in a prescriptive code, on a traditional code, we have objectives, we have requirements, and we also have prescribed solutions. Whereas in a performance-based approach, we have objectives, we have requirements, and we have alternate solutions. That means we can evaluate different solutions and check the performance and decide which one is the best option, not only at the system, but at, at, at every level, like the spacing of the stirrups I mentioned. So basically, performance-based design gives us the ability to innovate and to evaluate and have alternate things and to be more explicit in the design decisions. For new buildings, this, the way to do that would be to basically use the prescriptive methods to start with, and then we conform to the codes, and we do not automatically believe that conforming to the code will ensure safety. We will evaluate and verify that it does meet this, the, the, the intended purpose of the safety. So, two important sentences. Performance is not guaranteed automatically by code conformance. If you follow the code, it does not mean the building will have high performance. Second is, performance can be achieved without code conformance. So the two statements are very important here. We can have the same intended performance in the code without following the code. And if we follow the code, we may not have the intended performance that the code intended in its spirit. So the two, two statements can be true in, in sometimes and sometimes often. And so that's the real need or reason why we need to go to the performance-based design. And for existing structures, this is very important, as I mentioned, because this gives us a means to evaluate how the existing structures are currently expected to perform in the current as built 
not as designed on that code or not evaluated compared to the current code. So if you take one building, for example, maybe a 30, 40 years old building, and you try to evaluate by the current design code, I can assure you, you will find it deficient and you will say, oh, the building needs 100% retrofitting. Every column has to be retrofitted. Every beam has to be retrofitted. But that's not reality. But the performance-based design will look at it in a different way. And it might find that only few columns, few locations actually need to be fixed. So the performance-based design gives us the ability to identify the problems in the performance that affect the performance and only fix those, not try to make the entire structure conform to the code requirements that they do not affect the performance. So that's the key difference. And especially performance-based design is useful for existing building. In fact, it was developed primarily to tackle the problem of uh, retrofitting and tackle the problem of evaluating the performance of existing buildings for new. So originally, it was started as an earthquake-based approach. So it was primarily for earthquake because earthquakes you know, cause significant damage. And they typically go beyond the, uh, the, the, the design range. The, the, so that's why it started from there. But now it is being used for other cases also, for wind and for other hazards as well. So you can evaluate the performance of a structure for any kinds of hazard, any kinds of event, uh, be it earthquake, be it fire, be it uh, uh, flood or wind and so on. So that's the idea. The idea is that you look at the structure as built or as designed and see how it's going to perform for a given uh, target of um, uh, hazard and also under the you know, given performance indicators, which can be decided uh, by structures. So let me just go very quickly on where this, the structural design is heading or where it has come from. So this is just, uh, uh, if you go for the history, we started with intuitive design. That means, as, as I mentioned a long time ago, builders, master builders, without calculations, will build structures. and. They, you know, based on their experience and intu intuition, and they were called master builders because they knew better. Then after that, we had the code-based design. As I mentioned, the codes came in when we start to when, when mass mass construction, and a lot of people got involved in construction. And then after that, that led to performance-based design, which we are talking about today. And performance-based design is, still has deficiencies, which we will discuss in the second or third part. And then we, look, we, went, we, are going, we went to consequence-based and risk-based design, which looks at the risk of not following or risk of not achieving the performance. And then finally, the resilience-based design, which looks at the entire um, the, the risk disaster impact of the structural design. So that's where structural engineering is heading. So what we should do now is that for new buildings, we should design, you do a performance-based design after we have done the code-based design. For existing buildings, we should use the performance-based evaluation and we to avoid future disasters. And the most important thing is that we can now design structures which are damage controlled. So we look at the areas where damage will occur and focus on those and control them. So what is going to be next? So today we talked about why performance-based design should be done. And so we established that it's a good thing and we need it and why it is, it is valuable. And then next we will discuss what is performance-based design really and what it is not. Then after that, when and how to conduct performance-based design and finally, benefits of doing performance-based design. So we'll discuss this in four different talks. So thank you so much, and I hope that you find this discussion uh, valuable in your design, whatever design you're, you're doing, and it will have some impact on how we design for the future.